Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, or good afternoon, and welcome to this Kathy webinar with three senior insurance licensing regulators from across the country. My name is Keith Martin, and I am co-executive director of the Canadian Association of Financial Institutions in Insurance, or CAFI. On behalf of myself and my co-executive director colleagues, Brendan Wicks, and the CAFI Board of Directors, thank you for joining our webinar today. The Canadian Association CAFI is a not-for-profit association dedicated to the development of an open and flexible insurance marketplace. Our 13 members include the insurance arms of Canada's major banks and credit unions, along with their insurer business partners, which underwrite credit protection insurance and travel insurance. This is the second of three summer 2020 webinars we are hosting with regulatory authorities from across Canada. Today, we are pleased to have a panel of executives from regulatory authorities which focus on licensing. Each of these individuals is very busy and we are grateful to them for making the time to speak with us about their views of how the regulatory and licensing environment has been and will be of Haynes, Deputy Director of Licensing at New Brunswick's Financial and Consumer Services Commission, the FCNB. The FCNB is responsible for the administration and enforcement of provincial legislation that regulates securities, insurance, pensions, credit unions, trust and loan companies, cooperatives, and more. Catherine oversees licensing for both the insurance and consumer affairs divisions. She works with industry members, licensees and consumers to ensure their understanding of the requirements related to the Insurance Act, the Real Estate Agents Act, the Mortgage Brokers Act, the Direct Sellers Act, and several others. Ms. Haynes holds a Master of Business Administration degree from the University of New Brunswick. She began working with SCNB in 2014, moving to government after 10 years. An issue which appears to have resolved itself. Our next panelist is Brent Rathgaber, Director of Policy and Government Relations at the Alberta Insurance Council. Brent earned Bachelor of Arts in Public Administration and Bachelor of Laws degrees from the University of Saskatchewan. He practiced law in Calgary, Red Deer, and Edmonton. He was elected the MLA for Edmonton Calder in 2000 to his law practice in 2005. Brent became the executive aggressive contractors of Canada. Brent was a as a and he was in the 11 federal election. He was a member of Brent had significant parliamentary and committee duties. However, on June 5th, 2013, Brent resigned from the Conservative Caucus due to its lack of commitment to transparency and open government. And thereafter, he sat as an independent member of the House of Commons. Following the 2015 federal election, Brent worked as a political cons consultant and wrote a weekly column for iPolitics. In the fall of 2019, Brent was appointed to his current role as Director of Policy and Government Relations at the Alberta Insurance Council. Our third panelist is Brett Thibault, Director of Governance and Stakeholder Engagement at the Insurance Council of BC. In that staff executive role, Brett liaises with the Crown Agency's Board Resourcing Office, CABRO, regarding council member appointments and serves as the staff representative on council's organizational oversight committees, such as the Governance Committee and Regulatory Audit Committee, as well as policy committees, such as the New Life Agent Supervision Task Force. Brett also represents Council on a number of committees with the Canadian Insurance Services Regulatory Organizations, or CISRO, including the LLQP Governance Committee and the General Insurance Licensing Qualification Review Committee. Prior to joining Council as a staff member in 2016, Brett was a voting member and a past chair of the Insurance Council of BC. Brett earned a, a BA at Simon Fraser University and also holds a designation and membership with the Chartered Insurance Professional Society and the BC Society of Fellows. 
Now, I want to mention that today's webinar will be recorded and posted on our CAFE website in the near, near future. If you have any questions that you would like to pose to our presenters during the Q&A session, which we have uh, allotted 20 minutes for during the concluding session section of today's webinar, please send them to me as the host using the Q&A function of Zoom, and I will pose them on your behalf. Unless you specifically request in your question to be identified as its source, I will pose all questions to our panelists on an anonymous basis. And just before we get the webinar on, I want to extend a special welcome to a number of VIP guest attendees. In addition to many representatives from our 13 CAFE member companies, we have attendees today from allied industry associations, such as the Canadian Life and Health Insurance Association, CLHIA, and the Travel Health Insurance Association, or THEA, and from insurance and financial services regulators and policymakers from across Canada, including the BC Financial Services Authority, the BC Ministry of Finance, the Insurance Council of BC, the Alberta Insurance Council, Alberta Treasury Board and Finance, the Insurance Council of Manitoba, the Saskatchewan Financial and Consumer Affairs Authority, the, Author the Autorité des Marchés Financiers in Quebec, or the AMF, Insurance Councils of Saskatchewan, the Government of Yukon, the Financial Services Regulatory Authority of Ontario, or FISRA, the Canadian Council of Insurance Regulators, the CCIR, the Canadian Insurance Services Regulatory Organizations, or CISRO, the Office of the Superintend Superintendent of Financial Institutions, or OSFI, and the Ombudsman for Life and Health Insurance, or OLI. Welcome to you all. I would now like to begin the uh, webinar by asking the first question, and that question is what each of our panelists feels has been the biggest COVID-19 driven surprise to them in their work as an insurance regulator. Catherine, let me call you on you first to get the conversation started. Thank you, and uh, thank you very much for having me here today. And uh, although it's not necessarily a surprise, I would say that I've been very impressed with how well and generally how quickly both regulators and members of industry have adapted to the challenges presented by COVID-19. Um, Thankfully, it's not very often that your entire operation is turned upside down in this in this way. Um, we certainly appreciate the, the regular communication from industry members reaching out either directly to our office or um, via the CCIR or CICERO organizations to provide updates and outlining the challenges that they've been experiencing. And again, it's not surprising necessarily, but good to see that companies were really keeping the, the safety of their employees and the needs of their customers front and center as they went through modifying their operations to, to adapt to the COVID-19 requirements. Now, I, I was thinking about this question in relation to licensing in particular, and, and we're very fortunate here at FCMB that we've moved most of our insurance licensing processes online several years ago. And so we were able to, to really continue to process applications and follow up on inquiries pretty seamlessly. Um, once we had everyone set up to work remotely, uh, of course, there were a few issues, uh, but overall FCMB um, has continued to maintain our operations during a time when most of our staff were working from home. And I, I would say, um, the other piece that, that helped was the New Brunswick government did extend all of our licenses and registrations, um, ultimately until the end of July of 2020, which gave industry some relief and extra time to take care of these, uh, these requirements. So again, not surprising, but definitely impressed with how well um, our organization, along with regulators uh, in the other jurisdictions and industry has been able to adapt quickly to the, the challenges. Thank you, Catherine. And uh, Brent, could you comment on this issue? Uh, yes, I'd like to thank uh, Kathy for giving me the opportunity to appear on this panel. Um, I certainly agree with what Catherine said uh, from the New Brunswick perspective. The only thing that I would add to that is um, in Alberta, I was qu quite surprised that the demand for our services did not decline at all. In fact, in many ways, they spiked 
um, during and, and st still during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. As I'm sure you know, Alberta's economy was recessed even before COVID-19 due to um, resource pricing. Um, and that actually resulted, somewhat surprising, but I guess it's logical that with people um, lose employment or become underemployed or have their businesses shut down, they're looking for new and alternate ways to earn revenue. And uh, we found in Alberta that insurance was close to the top of that list. So um, while many businesses and some regulators um, had less to do in May, June, July, and August, uh, we actually had more to do. We actually had more people who were wanting to uh, write our exams and apply for licensing. Um, and similar to New Brunswick, we're fully automated. So we were able to um, accommodate the registrations and the renewals. Uh, we had some challenges with, with respect to the examinations, um, but we, we, we got through them uh, with, with some modifications. But that was the surprise to me, Keith, was that the requests for our service has actually increased. Very much for that, Brent. That's very interesting. Brett, could I ask you for your thoughts on this issue? Absolutely, uh, and thank you, um, Kathy, for uh, inviting me to participate as well. Um, I, I guess similar to Alberta, what um, surprised us probably the most, it's not all that exciting, is, is that um, we normally pre-COVID would receive three to 400 new license applications a month, and uh, we really haven't seen any attrition to that rate um, throughout COVID thus far, and, you know, I. I Relatively speaking, it's still it's still early. We you know as far as the economy goes and uh, things like that. But um, we've been relieved and encouraged thus far to see that um, requests for licensure have not gone down at all. In fact, it just kind of ticked along as they were pre-COVID. Okay, very interesting. Um, I'm going to go to you now, Brent, and uh, follow up with Brett as well. Uh, on a question that's a little bit more specific to BC and Alberta because uh, both of uh, your regimes include a, a licensing authorities um, and, and uh, government appointed industry councils. And uh, that must have been a significant adjustment to uh, manage those previously in-person meetings remotely. Uh, just like to ask both of you, starting with you, Brent, uh, how, how have you been able to adapt to conducting the work of these industry councils, which are integral to your businesses and to your uh, licensing um, uh, uh, and regulatory activities, um, and in particular around the disciplinary aspects of your mandate, uh, ha have you had any impact from the uh, move to a virtual environment? Brent, did you did you want to start on that? Um, sure, we were able to adjust to the hearings and the council meetings um, quite easily, and. Alberta might be unique in this regard, I'm not sure, in that we operate out of two offices. Um, I'm sitting here in, in uh, sunny Edmonton, Alberta, home of the Stanley Cup playoffs, but we have no team playing. Um, <laughs> and uh, we, also have an, we also have an office in Calgary of approximately equal size. So uh, pre-COVID, um, our council meetings and our, our disciplinary panels would generally meet in both of those uh, venues simultaneously linked together by closed circuit television. Now, um, when COVID-19 struck, uh, our meetings beginning in late March, early April um, expanded upon that. So now we weren't uh, meeting in only two locations. We were meeting in those two locations, but most of our board members were uh, zooming in on a, on a computer, uh, in their office or more than likely in their home. Uh, but we were already used to having uh, virtual meetings in two locations. Um, so expanding that to seven or eight locations wasn't a major adjustment, was not a major adjustment for us. Thank you, Brent. And uh, how about you, Brent? Brett? How, how did it work out in your jurisdiction? Yeah, so I guess we're a little bit different in that um, Pre-COVID, 100% uh, of our council-related um, procedures and meetings um, took place in person. We'd never really had a remote meeting to speak of. Um, that said, we closed our office on March 17th, and um, immediately thereafter, um, 
began hosting our meetings virtually using uh, Microsoft Teams. Um, so we've had our council meetings, we've had all of our oversight committees meet. Um, we even kind of rejigged our um, uh, annual board training to be done remotely. Uh, we've done onboarding sessions for new council members remotely. Um, basically, all of the operational and oversight work of council has been done remotely thus far. It's worked really well. Um, as far as discipline procedures go, I, again, all of these had um, only ever been done in person in the past. Um, we've um, since uh, April have hosted uh, we basically have a two-step discipline process. We have a re review committee, which is first a little less formal, and then we have a full-on hearing um, process that includes legal counsel on both sides, a court reporter. Um, it, it's very formal. Um, so we've had eight review committees. We've had two hearings, um, all done virtually. And um, it's actually, I, I, I mean, personally, I've been quite surprised that uh, the feedback has been overall positive by all the participants. Um, so, you know, it's an option definitely for us moving forward as we move through and pass the pandemic. Thanks, Brad. And uh, Catherine, I'm gonna ask you a slightly different question. Um, the New Brunswick government has uh, very quickly locked things down and in fact closed the province's borders back in March to anyone who is not a resident of the province, including Canadians from other provinces. And has subsequently created a bit of an Atlantic Canada bubble where people from the four Atlantic provinces can travel freely within those four provinces, um, but, uh, but there are restrictions on those from outside the region. Has this had any impact on uh, the FCMB's work during uh, this wave of the pandemic or upon any of your policy perspectives on insurance, including travel insurance? I would really enjoy your comments on that. Uh, thank you. Um, to be honest, the, the concerns that we've had specific to travel insurance uh, pre-COVID remain the same, uh, even, even with the uniqueness of the Atlantic travel bubble. Um, what we're looking for is the, the continued proper disclosure to consumers as travel restrictions open up to make sure that they are fully advised of what is covered and what is not. Um, obviously, that's going to be more and more important uh, as part of any Canadians traveling, whether they're coming into the Atlantic region or anywhere else. With, uh, with respect to our operations, it really hasn't um, created any, any specific challenges. Um, with uh, with our, our licensees, we have about 50% of our licensees are, are non-resident in New Brunswick anyway, so our, our communication with them uh, continues to, to be via our online licensing portal. Um, through email communication, phone calls, and um, we, uh, th those particular licensees aren't, aren't the ones who are traveling to uh, do their work. That's all being done remotely. Okay, thank you for that, Catherine. And maybe I'll just follow up on, on the fact that you touched on travel insurance, which has been the subject of a lot of attention in the media and in policy circles. And I might start with you, Catherine, and ask you, what do you think are some new expectations that regulatory and licensing authorities may have of the travel insurance industry coming out of uh, the experience with COVID-19? Um, well, again, as previously mentioned, I, I think what we, we want to ensure that individuals uh, have the, the proficiency requirements that are needed to really properly advise consumers on what coverage they should be obtaining. Uh, and that again, they are properly educating and disclosing to consumers what is included and what is not. Um, I, I, I would also say that um, the consistency um, across jurisdictions will continue to be important in terms of information or requirements in one jurisdiction, ideally, um, the industry is getting the same message from uh, as much as possible, uh, barring unique legislative requirements from other jurisdictions. And that's really where the work of organizations such as CCIR and Cicero come into play so that we, we understand uh, some of the unique challenges to the industry and, and as much as possible can provide a, a coordinated um, response 
when applicable. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Brett, could you comment on this issue around travel insurance? Sure. Uh, you know, when it comes to travel insurance, um, from our perspective, I would say nothing new. Um, it's the same old expectations, and and that is that um, that the client client be informed about the products that they're purchasing. So make sure that the customers understand what the product covers, what it, and more importantly, what it doesn't cover, and um, and making sure that um, what a client's expectations as far as a claims process goes are clear, so that they understand what to expect. Um, and, you know, these things have, have always been important, but I'd suggest that, you know, coming through and out of COVID that um, they're probably more important than ever. Um, and uh, there just can't be any surprises to customers, I'd say. Excellent. And, and Brent, uh, last word on this to you. Yeah, the only thing I'll add to that is, um, and I checked with our compliance folks yesterday in anticipation of this question, um, our complaints regarding uh, travel insurance agents are way, way down. And the only logical explanation for that is that there are less policies being sold because people are traveling less, which is logical because, you know, our borders to the U.S. are closed and uh, most, most European borders are closed. So, I, so our, uh, our, our, our complaints are way down. So I agree with Brett. It's, it's the same um, uh, considerations and concerns regarding uh, properly explaining the policy to the consumer, but apparently less of that happening because there's less travel going on. Okay, thank you for that. And I just want to remind participants in the call that you're invited to ask questions using the Q&A function of Zoom, and I will receive those questions and then pose them on your behalf. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, pick up on, on your comments, Brent, and ask you uh, a sort of follow-up question, not just on travel insurance, but on insurance more generally. Have there been areas of uh, additional complaints or concern? Have you um, been exposed to any issues that uh, are a concern uh, during this pandemic that, uh, that perhaps are, are, are unique to the current situation and, and weren't as significant previously? Uh, yeah, the, I, I think the one concern that we had not dealt with previously, um, but do not have jurisdiction to uh, determine, is the whole issue of, of uh, business insurance and business interruption insurance where we received um, many inquiries and many complaints uh, from individuals who, who had concerns about their coverage or thought they had coverage when they didn't. Um, now, our, as I'm sure you know, the Alberta Insurance Council re regulates intermediaries. The actual insurers are regulated by the superintendent of insurance in, inside the Department of Finance. So those types of inquiries were all referred to the proper regulator, which is not us. But we did receive um, numerous uh, complaints and calls about business interruption insurance. Um, but like I said, all we could do is refer them to the proper authority. Thank you. Catherine, could you comment on this issue? Uh, similar to Brent, I, I checked with our uh, compliance team to, in anticipation of today's call. And surprisingly, we really haven't had any different or unique types of uh, complaints coming in um, with respect to misconduct of our licensees. It really is the, the same type of issues that we've run into pre-COVID. And particularly with respect to licensing where individuals are, are not properly renewing their licenses in a timely manner or not following up um, when our office reaches out to obtain further information. And uh, more generally speaking, our, our office, because we're uh, a regulator not only of insurance but of several other financial and consumer services industries, we, we have noted increases in uh, inquiries and complaints related to COVID-19 fraud and scams going on. And part of our mandate is certainly to provide information and educate consumers, not only in relation to the insurance industry, but overall. So that's something that FCMP put a, a special committee in place so that we, 
would maintain awareness of, of these types of frauds and scams and could then pass the information along to New Brunswickers so that they could be mindful of them and, and uh, not fall victim. Okay, thank you. And uh, Brett, your comments on this? Yeah, so I'm similar to Catherine and Brent. Um, we have not at this point anyway, um, are, we're not noticing or seeing any new trends with respect to licensing misconduct. Um, that being said, uh, we are aware that in times of financial turmoil, turmoil um, licensing misconduct does tend to increase uh, at some level. So we are keeping a very close eye on, on misconduct. Um, the one thing I would say is that um, with, with the pandemic and the trend towards uh, digitization of insurance um, and that being even may maybe accelerated due to the pandemic, we are uh, paying close attention to what that means for public protection ultimately. Um, you know, we wanna make sure that there continues to be adequate supervision um, of the sales process and that personal information is protected. So we're interested to see how that evolves. Okay, thank you. And I'm gonna follow up in the uh, reverse order, uh, starting with you, Brent, uh, uh, Brett, on this issue, uh, because I do have a question from the audience and I'll just read it to you. It's regarding clients misunderstanding the extent of business interruption coverage. Do the panelists have any concerns that there might have been misrepresentation by the agents who sold the products. Brett, did you, do you have any such concern? Um, I guess on the surface, no. I mean, it's hard to, um, it would be hard for us to comment on individual um, licensees and their practices in the field. I mean, um, everybody's different. Everybody has a sales process that they work with and some may be better at pointing out exclusions and than others, but um, at this point, no, um, we don't believe that our licensee base is in any way um, dropped the ball on, on how they sold the product and communicated that to clients. All right, thank you. Catherine, what are your thoughts on this? I, I would echo Brett's comments. Um, certainly, I, I'd like to hope that uh, perhaps misunderstandings took place, but one of one of the expectations would be certainly that uh, supervisors and, and companies are doing an excellent job with oversight of their employees to make sure that the, the agents and brokers uh, know how to properly communicate um, information to their clients so that they are fully informed. And particularly where industry is adapting and, and more and more employees are working remotely and, and that can include different communications methods with their clients, we would expect that proper oversight is being maintained um, and, and supervision so that uh, the companies are, are really comfortable that everyone is doing the right thing. Thank you. And Brent, on, on this issue, any thoughts? Um, well, yeah, I mean, obviously, I mean, agents, it's incum incumbent upon agents to fully explain uh, the policies and the coverages and the exclusions. Um, and if they don't, uh, they, they certainly can and will be subject to uh, disciplinary proceedings before the Alberta Insurance Council. Um, that being said, and I think I started, started off this topic with respect to business interruption insurance, um, we don't have any uh, current complaints against any of our licensees. Um, all and, and, it's, and it's not a large number. Of course, I wouldn't know if it's a large number or a small number. I only know the, the ones that came through us and were referred to the superintendent. But any complaints regarding um, business interruption insurance that were that uh, uh, that we are aware of uh, were allegations made against the insurer, not against the person that sold the policy. Thank you. And uh, th there was a, a commentary that there was a, a significant reduction in, in travel insurance complaints and um, the suggestion that one of the reasons uh, might be that there are fewer people taking out um, travel insurance since there's not a lot of travel taking place. I have a bit of a challenge of that interpretation that I'm going to uh, just read out from uh, a participant on the call from, from a, uh, a member of the audience. 
and I'll ask each of you to comment on levels of travel claims. And that the reduction in complaints may be due to the proactive approach taken by industry rather than a lower number of policies sold. Uh, the comment goes on to say complaints are generally generated as a result of the claims process and not the sale of policies. Uh, Brent, did you want to comment on that? Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's another possible explanation. Um, and again, we don't have the kind of numbers uh, regarding complaints against those who sell um, travel insurance, I, I think, to make any meaningful correlations. Uh, but the, the, viewer, the viewer's uh, theory is certainly more than possible. Or explanation. Catherine? It's explanation. It's not a theory. It's an explanation. Uh, I would say you cut out at some point during the question, but I think I Thank you. It. And I, I would I would say that um, I I would hope uh, that that is the case. But again, I don't have the the data uh, to be able to fully answer that question. Okay. Thank you. And Brett, any comments on that? Yeah, I would just I mean I would just add that I I think it's a fair comment um, without you know. Um, I don't have any data myself either, um, but I would say that the the industry has been extremely responsive and 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 taking claims and needs of clients seriously. And although clients may not have liked the answer um, in all situations, um, I do think that um, the industry response overall to to the claims ha has been has been there. It's been solid. Thank you, Brad. And I'm going to do a follow-up from the uh, audience again uh, on travel insurance. And I'll start with you, Brett, which is uh, a question about airlines promoting travel to the USA, contrary to travel advisories from Global Affairs Canada. And the question is, how will, how will you as regulators react when complaints are received due to insurers denying coverage since there are advisories in effect saying that you should not be traveling to the USA and uh, most travel policies will not cover a claim if you travel uh, uh, to a country in, in which there's an advisory that you should not be, not be going. So Brett, I'll start with you. I know it's a bit of a, a difficult question to answer, but uh, I'm wondering if, if you can offer some comments. I mean, I guess I would say that, um, I mean, our, our role, our job is to um, oversee this, the, 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 the sales process, the licensee, um, process. Uh, and so what we would want to do, regardless of, of the complaint, is make sure that and review what, what the sales process looked like, what was communicated to the client by our licensees, the people that we have uh, authority over, and, um, and take it from there and decide whether or not that was adequate and appropriate. Brent? Um, yeah, and bearing in mind, again, we um, only regulate intermediaries, not underwriters or insurers, but um, we, we, can't, we can't totally pass the buck on this either. Um, it's incumbent upon us to make sure that those that we do license, the brokers and the agents, are fully up to date with respect to um, travel restrictions and uh, contingencies regarding those uh, travel um, restrictions what travel restriction might be in place today might not be in place a month from now when the travel w was uh, supposed to occur. So it's also, in my view, incumbent upon the agents to advise potential clients and clients of uh, all sorts of contingencies with, re with respect to the likelihood or unlikelihood that travel will be allowed and to um, frequently um, check in with uh, with Transport Canada and Global Affairs Canada and other authorities that can provide up-to-date information with respect to travelability. Thank you. Uh, Catherine, your thoughts on this? I, I would uh, agree with my colleagues and I, I think the recurring theme so far of today's discussion seems to be making sure that our licensees are informed um, so that they can clearly communicate with their clients um, the specific details and exemptions of, of any policies. And then I, I would extend that out to 
I guess, a greater theme of communication um, of industry with uh, regulators, with groups like CCIR, CICERO, with respect to trends that they're observing um, as a result of uh, the new reality in, in COVID-19 times. Thank you. I, I want to, uh, to move off travel insurance now and speak about the broad societal and business changes that we've observed and ask you each for your own personal thoughts on what you think uh, will be an, an ongoing trend or an ongoing reality emerging out of this. I mean, we've, we've heard about how much, uh, how many consumers have embraced digitization and we've seen uh, maybe a decade's progress in terms of adoption of digital means in, in uh, a few months time. Um, obviously, working remotely is an, another such issue where there have been some significant changes. And there are many other areas where there, there may be some permanent shifts in the way we interact with each other and the way we do business. Catherine, let me start with you and ask you if you think there you know, are, are some, uh, some such trends that are going to make a, themselves a permanent fixture in our, our lives post-pandemic. Well, although <laughs> you certainly wouldn't want it to occur this way, but the pandemic has certainly been a great disruptor of business practices and has uh, um, given, given rise to some more efficient uh, business processes, both within industry and within uh, the various regulatory organizations. Um, I think coming back to uh, an insurance licensing perspective, I think you will certainly see the, the trend continue with the uh, organizations moving their processes online. Um, certainly our, our organization here at FCMB, we, we started that several years ago and we are continuing to move uh, the remaining licensing processes to our online systems. And I, I think in that realm, um, one of the, the challenges that have come up um, is with respect to proficiency requirements, some of the uh, while all of the in-person licensing exams were put on hold um, in, in March. And the result of that has, um, there have been now online proctoring solutions for the LQP examinations, along with the various education providers moving to online uh, exams. And I think you'll see that trend continue as well, even as uh, many jurisdictions, in, including our own, um, are now offering in-person sessions again. I think you'll find that most of our licensees are, are going to prefer an online option moving forward. Thank you. Brett, your thoughts on this issue? Yeah, I, I mean, I would reiterate or agree um, if from our own perspective as an oversight body, um, we have um, the, the pandemic has allowed us to focus um, on our own technology needs and, and advancements. And we've spent a lot of time in um, reassigned resources to kind of speed up that process uh, for ourselves internally. And then, and then also, I think, and I'm not sure that this is new for, for, for us or for me, but um, the impact that digitization will have on, on distribution or more specifically, even our own licensee base is uh, something that um, we're watching. Uh, you know, the natural conclusion is for everyone to assume that the number of licensees will go down as, as, um, as technology improves and more things become digitized. Um, although I'm not sure that's necessarily true. Um, but if it is, you know, how much of an impact is it going to have on our organization? Um, you know, how long will the process take? What, you know, what will that look like? And um, even we're even thinking of, um, you know, agencies and how are they involved in a digitized sales process? You know, what will that look like? Um, how do we regularly make sure that the public is being protected throughout this transformation um, of distribution? And, um, you know, we even sit there and think, so you know, people are talking about insurance sales through bots. I'm sure all of this will come much quicker. Um, and, and how do you regulate a bot? Are we allowed to license a bot? And uh, those are kind of some of the things that keep us up at night, sadly. Right. Understood. And the uh, final word on this to you. Uh, yeah, I mean, a couple of things, and some of it's been mentioned, but I, but I do think that this pandemic will have uh, changed 
how this industry works and also how the regulators of this industry work. Um, we've been conducting in-person exams um, since uh, May 4th. We were up and running, uh, but we're also experiencing or experimenting with uh, remote examinations and remote proctoring. And although we're not quite where we need to be with respect to the security and, uh, and personal information of our of our exam takers, um, we are going to get there. We are, we are going to get there this fall where we can offer examinations uh, anywhere where you have a high-speed internet uh, connection. And once that occurs, um, I think brick and mortar examinations are going to become a thing of the past. People will just prefer to take the exam. Most, not, not all people, but most people will, will prefer to take uh, the exam in the city in which they live, if it's not Edmonton or Calgary, um, or in the comfort of the of their own home, if I mean, pr provided it can be properly monitored and proctored. Um, yeah, but the other two changes, I'll, I'll be very quick. Um, I mean, organizations. I'm, I'm quite involved in Cicero, um, and previously they would meet a couple times a year at least in Winnipeg or in Montreal and this fall, I think it was going to be Charlottetown. Um, all of that travel is canceled. All of those conferences are canceled. They're all going to be done um, in a platform not dissimilar to what we're doing here this morning um, at incredible cost savings, both in terms of time and in terms of travel and hotel expenses for the, for the attendees. Um, and, and the third one is, I, I think, we've learned and perhaps to our surprise that some of our employees are fully capable of performing their duties uh, from home. And I think in some instances uh, that will become a, a permanent reality where there will be some functions and some, uh, some employees who will not require an office or at least not a full-time office. Um, and that too will lead to efficiencies in, in, in terms of lease space. So, so yes, there are, there are changes uh, that have been caused by this pandemic, pandemic, some good, some not so good, but they are going to be changes that I think are going to last for a very long time. All right, thank you, Brendan. Just uh, picking up on this theme, I know that all of you um, in, in, uh, internally do look at what is happening in other jurisdictions within Canada, uh, in international jurisdictions. Have you had any learnings from how other regulatory bodies, either domestically or internationally, have dealt with licensing or other regulatory issues? And are any of those um, uh, trends that you might uh, look at applying in future in internally based on, on the learnings from other jurisdictions? Uh, Brent, can I, can I ask you to comment on that? Um, yeah, briefly, uh, Cicero, as you know, is um, a, a national organization of uh, insurance intermediary regula uh, regulatory agencies, and uh, uh, several of our um, senior management team are involved in a variety of Cicero uh, subcommittees, and um, there's a concerted effort amongst most, most uh, Cicero jurisdictions to uh, move towards um, online life insurance exams and online proctoring. Uh, we have decided to go in a slightly different direction. We still wanted to deliver them, uh, but we're, we're not satisfied with the, the security that the uh, proposed uh, provider provides. Uh, but nonetheless, um, we do share best practices and work with other uh, in Canadian intermediate insurance regulators to look for, for best practices and for means of uh, moving forward given, uh, given the reality of COVID-19. Thank you for that, uh, Brent. Catherine, your thoughts? Um, well, certainly as to, to Brent's comments, we, we also participate in many of the CISRO committees and, and look forward to hearing best practices and sharing our own with other jurisdictions. Um, one of the things that we also find helpful is just to, to be aware, uh, particularly through the pandemic, of what's going on in the other provinces. Um, for example, New, New Brunswick has been in a fairly good position with respect to COVID-19. 
quite some time with relatively few active cases and um, a lot of our day-to-day -day activities are opened up. And as it, it's important for us to continue to be reminded that other jurisdictions are not in the same place. So our licensees who are not only licensed in New Brunswick, um, they are potentially experiencing very different circumstances in Ontario and Quebec and Alberta and with respect to what their day-to-day -day activity looks like. So I find that's very helpful in, in understanding the, the experience across other jurisdictions and, and we'll be mindful of that as we make any um, recommendations or, or uh, changes to our processes. Excellent, thank you, Catherine. And Brett, your thoughts on this? I would just add that um, um, I, I, you know, I think the technology piece for us uh, in BC ha has been um, um, the importance of it has, has kind of risen to the top, and uh, you, much like like Brent mentioned, the LQP and even our licensing processes, we still um, have to get those online, um, and and our, you know, we had we do have projects that are doing that right now. We are reviewing and examining how we can uh, uh, make those things happen. And uh, so we're, we've accelerated that pace. Excellent, thank you. Um, all three of you have just spoken about best practice in your own bodies, your own regulatory bodies and licensing authorities. Um, I'm gonna start with you, Catherine, and ask you to comment about industry. And uh, what, what do you feel industry during this pandemic has done well what do you think we could have done better as an industry and uh, improved on? We would very much value each of you telling us and sharing with us your thoughts on that question. Um, well, I think industry overall has been uh, very, very proactive in terms of reaching out to the regulator regulators and, and uh, communicating some of their challenges. And really, at least on my experience, uh, they also seem to be concerned not only meeting regulatory requirements, but also keeping their, their customers um, front and center in, in terms of what their needs are and, and how they can better service them. Um, one, of the, one of the comments that we've received from industry is the, the challenge of addressing an increase in, in call volumes or inquiries as a result of COVID-19 questions. And at the same time, having potentially reduced staff because of absenteeism connected to COVID-19. And so I think they've done well in terms of with creative solutions to, to really continue to operate effectively and make sure that their customers are, are well serviced. Um, in terms of, I wouldn't say doing better, but uh, I think Brett had, had touched on it earlier. Certainly moving forward, cybersecurity and protection of client information is going to be um, more important than ever as more and more processes and day-to-day and -day operations move online. We want to make sure that um, the, the information is protected um, and, and that organizations have uh, proper policies in place to, to do so. Thanks, Kat. Brett, do you want to pick up on this thing? Yeah, so I, I believe I mentioned it, but uh, I think overall the response from industry has been um, has been respectable. It has been good, uh, attentive, um, particularly when you consider this is a once in a one of a kind event. Nobody ever, nobody has any track record for an event like this. Um, and I would just say that you know, as we come through the pandemic, um, as we move forward and out. Um, I think the industry would be well served to kind of look back and uh, review our actions, um, particularly as it relates to the fair treatment of customers. Um, you know, review all, you know, all the industry participants should be reviewing. You know, how 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 do we measure up? Um, could we have done better? Um, you know, what what do we need to change so that we can be better the next time this happens? Those are the kind of questions I think we should be asking. We should all be asking our, our organizations as we move through the pandemic. Excellent, thank you, Brett. Uh, and Brent, final word on this to you. Yeah, a couple things. I mean, I think the industry um, did a great job simply by staying open. Um, in Alberta, and I suspect in every other jurisdiction, insurance was de declared 
uh, an essential service back in March. And that allowed us as regulators to stay open and allowed insurers to stay open and conduct business. And, and, that, and that's important because, I mean, if, you're, if your automobile policy expires at the end of May and there's no insurance agent to open in your town, uh, that could be a problem. So um, I congratulate them on staying open and continuing to service their client base, even if it was remotely, uh, even if it was with reduced hours. However it was done, it was done. Um, the one thing, and I guess this is not perhaps a criticism of the industry, but it's also perhaps a criticism of us as the regulator. There seemed to be a lot of misinformation and perhaps an assumption that um, the regulatory requirements were all on hold and were all suspended. And I know that in the larger uh, political sphere, things were suspended with in Edmonton, for example, with respect to property taxes, they normally do July 1st, but this year they're due September 30th. Um, but some of our regulatory requirements were not suspended. And, and the two most notable ones is that all our renewals are due June 30th. And so is the proof that you've had 15 continuing education hours. Uh, we came across a number of uh, agents and some firms that believed they didn't have to comply or that at least they didn't need, have to comply on that date. So it, they share some of the blame for, for falsely assuming. I guess we share some of the blame for not getting the message out. Um, but the message is what it always was, is that June 30th is renewal date. Renewal date. And uh, just, just following up on, uh, on some of these issues, I do have a question from the audience, specifically on credit protection insurance. And the question is uh, whether each of you could share your thoughts on how you think um, um, customers and will, will sort of uh, their level of acceptability of credit protection insurance, whether there'll be any shifts or changes coming out of the pandemic experience and whether there might be any new trends for credit protection insurance. Any thoughts on that? Sorry, who do you want to start? I'll start with you, Brent. Okay. Um, I, I don't have any. I don't have any hard data. Um, I have a, a tiny bit of anecdotal evidence that yes, I, I, I think as people um, find challenges with respect to employment or find challenges with respect to their their business. Um, and, and purchase assets that they require and perhaps on credit um, that they're more likely to, uh, to ensure that indebtedness. Um, again, because I think, I think Canadians generally are going to be uh, taking on more debt. Uh, whether that insurance is affordable if you're not working is another question, but I, I, I'm going to think, I will think that there's going to be more interest at the very least in credit uh, related insurance, given that I suspect that loads are going to rise. Thank you. Uh, Catherine, your thoughts? Uh, again, I can't say that I have the, uh, the, the knowledge required to give a, a full answer on that, but I would also anticipate more interest in, in job loss insurance, given the, the current economic environment where people want to have that increased sense of security. But again, that is just anecdotal in my personal opinion. I can't say that that is founded on any, any data. Understood. Uh, Brett, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I would agree that um, on the surface, it seems like there will be an opportunity for the industry to grow this um, segment of business um, coming uh, out of the pandemic, for sure. It seems like a good fit, um, as long as we've got the right products and uh, there are no surprises, I think it's an opportunity. Okay, thank you. I have a licensing question from my... Uh co-executive director colleague, Brendan Wicks, and it's about FISRA's uh, announcement recently, earlier this month, in fact, that the current LLQP will not meet the minimum proficiency requirements for the use of the titles financial planner and financial advisor in Ontario in the future. Uh, let me start with you, Catherine. Any thoughts on that? And, and will, will that have an impact in New Brunswick? Um. Again, I, I don't think I'm actually the, the right person to, to answer that question. It's, uh, it's not something that I've, I've given any thought to up to this point. Understood. Did you have any comments, Brett? 
Um, yeah, I, I mean, I would say that um, that fits ver very much in alignment with how the Insurance Council of BC would feel feels about that that topic, that the, the title of a financial planner. Um, we have requirements in BC that um, limit or restrict the use of that title um, to people who have the credentials to call themselves that. So um, that that fits in very good alignment with how we conduct um, oversight here. And Brent, any comments? Um, nothing really to add. Um, there's no appetite in Alberta, as far as I know, to change the requirements. Um, financial planner is not a designation that uh, the Alberta Insurance Council uh, grants to anyone. Um, I don't expect there's going to be any change with respect to the LLQP in this jurisdiction. Excellent. Well, we're coming to the very end of our webinar. The hour has passed very quickly. You've been an excellent panel with a lot of insights. I'm, I'm very appreciative on behalf of our audience members to all three of you. My final question to each of you is your um, general final thoughts, uh, words to the wise, uh, any uh, nuggets of wisdom that you want to share or any final observations or, or recommendations. So just very open-ended uh, question to allow you to just offer your, your, your final, uh, final observations and comments. Let me start with you, Brent. Go next to you, Brett, and we'll give the final word to Catherine. Um, I th just generally speaking, uh, for any regulator or for any uh, insurance intermediary or underwriter, um, investments in technology um, are going to pay off many, many times. Uh, we, we did very well. We, we stayed open throughout the entirety of COVID-19. We were up and having exams on May 4th. The reason we were able to do that is because we've invested heavily in technology and technolo in technology security and in remote delivery. Um, so we are very happy that we did so and that allowed us to continue, continue to operate um, seamlessly. Thank you. Brett? I would really only suggest that um, all industry participants use this opportunity to, to reset, um, to come out the other end with strong, stronger products and better service propositions. Um, this, would, this should continue to help build confidence, uh, public confidence in the industry, um, which of course will be, which will be even more critical as we move forward and, and, and out of the pandemic and people start to travel again. Thank you very much. And final word to you, Catherine. Um, for me, I, I guess my, my recommendation would be to, to continue uh, with regular communication and that's um, leveraging technology to, to do something in your business, whether it is uh, with your agents, your brokers, your employees, whether it's with uh, ourselves as regulators, whether it's with your clients, it's not going to be the same. There's not likely to be any uh, in-person um, large-scale meetings in the near future, but thankfully, uh, as evidenced by today's session, technology has provided us with a lot of other options. And um, maybe it's just me, but I've, I've really enjoyed some of those Zoom calls where people's uh, children and pets make an unexpected visit <laughs> to, <laughs> to give some, some livelihood into the, into the session. So really continued uh, communication to, to ensure the success of your operation would be my recommendation. All right. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, thank you, Brent. Thank you, Brett. Uh, it's been a, a wonderful hour, a lot of great insights. We, uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, uh, on behalf of all those uh, on the call, I just want to once again say thank you. I also want to uh, just note this slide here that um, uh, just mentions that we will be having a series of uh, regulatory meetings uh, and webinars. And the third in this series will be in a month from now on Tuesday, September 29th at noon Eastern time with uh, regulators from Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba. Uh, that ends our meeting today. I want to uh, once again thank our three panelists and all audience participants, and I wish everyone a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.